back there talking. Good morning, church. How's everybody today? Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Look at that beautiful weather outside. Now, hopefully, everybody's getting out and getting a chance to take advantage of this weather. We haven't had weather like this since 2010. That's the last time we had decent weather for any given stretch or period of time. So it's, it's really kind of nice that way. Even though it's a bit on the dry side, you know, we set a new record. Uh, 29 days as of today with no rain. So like a little bit of rain, a little bit of moisture in there. As I'm walking across the yard the other the other day, we had a water main break over by our house, so we had no water. And so they said, well, you got to come through and you got to flush it, and make sure it's not through aerated faucets in case there's chunks and sediment that are coming through the pipes. And then you're not supposed to drink or, or uh, not supposed to drink the water or cook with it for three days. So. I went out and watered the front yard, so I guess it's pretty okay. Might as well put it out there. Go for it. It needs a good drink, so it, it got a good drink out of that one there. And I figured that our lights are probably fairly well flushed now. So, but anyway, uh, welcome if you're online with us here this morning. If you're watching online, please say hi in the notes in there so that we know that you're with us. And we're very, very happy that you're here. And for those who are here in person, um, don't go to that side of the room over there if you're watching this. Don't watch mine, but I mean your own. Um, wow, I gotta tell you, those little pumpkin cupcake things over there? Mm, yeah, it, it's kind of like Lay's, you know, you, you, can only, you can't only eat just one, and so I've been tearing myself away from that over there. Man, those are good. Really, really good. Well, this Wednesday, we're going to continue on with the, the Chosen Season 4, and uh, so we, we look forward to that. They've been uh, a little bit different, if you notice. Season 4 is a bit uh, a little stronger side than what Season 1, 2, and 3 were, um, but they're very, very, very well done, and uh, great messages in it all. Pastor Terry's got a great message for us on, on the uh, Season 4 message on what we went through uh, last Wednesday. And so, this coming, oh, this, this no, coming this Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah, we're a week ahead, aren't we? Yeah. Yes, we were a week before. <laughs> Last Wednesday then was we not a good day for me. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> men's breakfast is coming up this Saturday, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. So we were talking about that this morning, trying to make plans on what kind of eats we were going to have here. And we decided we were going to change the complete menu up to something different. That complete Huh? What? <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh -huh. yes, we will have biscuits and gravy. I'm pretty sure. Okay. So that will be held here. Yes. Yep. We first Saturday of each month. So nine o'clock here. Um, so yeah, we'll have biscuits and gravy. But we're looking for a different type of side dish. And so Doug had come up with one. Uh, we may try that out for Saturday. So the following Saturday, then on the twelfth, we're going to have. Orange track racing back in here again. So we're winding down the year. So this is October. November then is finals. So we follow NASCAR. So it starts in February and goes until November. And then in the downtime this year, we convert the track over. I'm really looking forward to that. It should be a lot of fun. Um, might have to get some paint and paint the side rails orange or something like that so we can still be orange track. Uh, but we do have Orange Track come in on the 12th. Registration uh, starts and we race at 10 o'clock in the morning, so 9 to 10 and then 10 on out. Um, then, 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 coming up, we're going to jump ahead to November. So the 2nd of November, we have men's breakfast again in the morning. And in the evening, we're going to have our movie, The Nativity. So we're going to show the movie of The Nativity, which comes from a little different perspective, and that's going to be uh, from the perspective of Mary. So we kind of get to see her in her growth pattern and everything um, as she's going through and uh, kind of told from her perspective of things. And uh, as we talked about in our series that we did on the Bible in here, we kind of talked about Mary and what it was like and what she went through. The neat thing about this movie is it follows almost exactly what we have talked about in our sermons and in our messages on so I thought it was really cool uh, so we'll see a trailer on that here this morning and 
Uh, we're going to have the link to today's message and music then in the notes again in there for us to review and make sure that you click on the links to listen to the music because there's a message in the music that we always tie into the message of the day, the sermon of the day. So a um, lot to look forward to in here. We've got fun stuff going on here. We're going to be setting up some tables here. We, we had the book crew go over and uh, there's a church that closed down and so uh, we got to go over and take a lot of their books because if not they would have gone to the trash. And so we've got a lot of Bibles, reference books, all kinds of different things. So we're going to start sorting those out here and then they're going to be free for anyone that wants them. Um, we're going to put some reference books and things in our shelves back here and some of the other Bibles that we have in there. Um, but we really, really, truly appreciate you going and doing that and, and getting all those things. So we've got a room full of books over here. Mike, say full, you need to look. Uh, there's quite a few. So thank you very much for going out and doing that for us here this week and getting that taken care of. So let us enter into a time of worship. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together today freely and openly to celebrate you, to celebrate you, to give you glory and honor in everything that we say and everything that we do today. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts to receive the message that we hear both in the word and in music today and to enhance our hearts with our fellowship with one another here today as we gather together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to research your word even, even deeper and come into uh, more meanings and as you reveal and uh, as we grow in our relationship to you, you reveal more of the mysteries of your word to us. So we just praise you and thank you for that. So open our ears to hear the message today. Open our eyes to understand and see the glory of your works all around us each and every day. We praise you and thank you in all these things in Jesus' name. So our call to worship this morning comes from Peter 1, 6 and 7. And it says, You rejoice in this, though for now a short time, you have to struggle in various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes through refined, though refined by fire, wow, I need to get my eyes recalibrated may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here Peter calls the believers to be encouraged and to rejoice, even though we're going through hard times, we're going through struggles, we're going through things. Hey, we're, we're called to rejoice in that suffering because the suffering is a testing of faith similar to that of the refining of gold. Now, just like gold, diamonds, or anything of value you don't use it at face value. You don't use it as it comes up out of the ground. See, it has to be refined. As in gold or precious metals, it gets refined by fire. So you put it in a smelting pot, it brings it up, you burn off all the impurities, you, you take all the scale and slag and things off the top of it, and you're left then with a much purer form of what it is that makes it so valuable. So if it's gold or silver or whatever it happens to be, a diamond as it comes out of the ground, you probably wouldn't even see it as a diamond compared to what you see sparkling on your fingers and things like that because it doesn't look anything similar to that until it's refined by a jeweler, until it's brought through the, the impurities and the dirt and the, the ugly stuff gets stripped away. And then you have the beauty of that gem that's left over. And see, that's what happens with us as we accept Christ into our lives. We strip away all that old stuff, all the junk, all the bad stuff, in order to get to the real value of the object. And the other, In other words, we need to have all of the junk stripped away from us that we piled on over the years, all the baggage we carry with us, all the things we shouldn't have done, all the sin, disgrace, all the shame, guilt, remorse, all that stuff gets stripped away through all of the trials that we face, we get refined to become what God wants us to be in the end. And it's more than just having us refined, but it defines then who we are as a believer in God. 
So it's kind of a neat thing. It's a double-edged sword. We get refined and we get defined then in how we respond to those trials, how we respond to those hard times defines then our character of who we are in Christ. So if you've never looked at it that way, it's pretty neat. So the refining process is necessary to get rid of all those impurities in our lives, all of our habits, all of our behavior. It's only then when we can begin to take on that appearance of Jesus and who Jesus wants us to be. So it goes on in here and it says, more valuable and may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As those rewards then are revealed in us as we are shaped and refined and defined, the rewards at Christ's coming make the testing then that we're going through now worthwhile. It's preparing us to be in the presence of God. We don't go to God dirty. We go to God as pure and as clean as refined and defined as we can be to be able to prepare us for God's glory. Our Christian walk is a journey and we start off with the initial seed of that message of salvation. But we move into other levels of increase as we grow in our relationship with God. As we grow in our relationship with the Lord. We grow in our spiritual giftings and then we start serving the church, serving our own and, and bringing forth the ministries that God has placed on our hearts individually to do as well. It's like moving from one level to the next to the next. We're being refined and defined as we prepare to meet our Savior. The future revealing of Christ will be a time for testing of the faith, for believers to reveal with that which is our genuine faith. You know, you got that commercial that's on TV with the little paper face that they hold up in front of them. We'll see a lot of Christians, a lot of people go through life that way. They, they have this facade that they, that they put on. Their faith may not be real or genuine, or it may not be developed, but they put on a facade for others to see. It's kind of like the Pharisees were. So what this means is this future revealing of Christ will be that testing of our faith to reveal who we are, our genuine faith in Christ. Then we look to forward to the coming of Christ, which means that is going to be the realization of our faith goal, of our entire journey that we've been on in our life. The completing of salvation for us in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. I know that's a lot. I'm sorry. You got two sermons for the price of one today, I guess. Um, I'd like to do a, a uh, bidding prayer this morning and here as we go through as it'll be responsive. So follow along with me as I read it on. Loving God, at the beginning of creation, you calm the chaos of the world. Be present now to those whose lives are suddenly filled with chaos. Grant them grace and calm in the midst of confusion. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. You have always shown us the way from darkness into light. For those who are struggling now to see the light, we ask that you would shine it a bit brighter in our world. Grant us all the grace to see a way forward through the present darkness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Throughout history, you have raised up leaders to care for your people. May those who are called upon to lead now in this time of despair be given the grace to do so with conviction and with compassion. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. You are truly a God of abundance. Open our eyes so that we may see how your ministries can use the abundance with which we have been blessed to help others and, and those in need. Grant us the grace to move with humility and prudence in all that we do. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. You are also a God of wonders. We have often struggled to imagine the breadth and depth of what is possible with you at our side. Grant us all, those directly affected and those holding them in prayer today, the grace of creativity in our response to these events. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. The psalmist sings, Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Let it be our song this day. 
May we and those that we pray for truly hope in the Lord. May we give that hope and give us strength and heart that we need to move from darkness into light today. In the name of the Lord we pray today. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Oh, good morning. I think one of the hardest things that we do as we prepare a message is to come up with a, a title that best fits. So the episode that we're going to watch on Wednesday is so full. There's an, and there's a lot of creative license, and I am not giving away the big part of that episode today. I just refuse. Um, but what it does is it talks about how life is so full of unanswered questions. There's so many things that happen to us that we just, whether it's as we're going into them, in the midst of them, or just after them, that we're just like, what's going on? And we see this time and time again throughout Scripture. Time and time again throughout our own lives. We've all gone through. We've all, well, we're all going through. And we will all go through some trial in our lives. In our call to worship this morning, Peter is reminding us that we will struggle with various trials. We all have prayed for God's intervention in our lives. I can look back with, and I, and I need these to see, I need them to read this, but I can look back at my life with 2020 vision and say, oh, yeah, I didn't do that quite right. Oh, that's what God was doing. All those different things. And when we prayed for that intervention, well, God's faithful. He answers every single one of our prayers. The problem that rises when we think of us our human side of things because sometimes the answer is yes. It's like, yeah, thank you, Lord. Sometimes it's no, it's like, why? And sometimes it's just quite as simple as not yet. I think we can all agree that there's times that we don't agree with his answer. No, God, I, like we know better than God does, right? No, I think it should have been this way, or I think it should have been that way. And I'm not, not sure you're right about that. But how many times in your life have you looked back at God's answer and gone, huh, he was right, go figure. Other times where you're still having trouble seeing why God answered the way that he did. The one thing that we can be sure of is that it is always for our good and for his glory. Think about if you've got kids, think about it. You, you stopped them from doing something. You answered their question. Yes, no, not yet. And it was only for their good. See, here's the thing. We, in those instances, you know, I've had the opportunity to say, oh, I was wrong, I'm sorry. But God, just like God doesn't make junk, God doesn't make mistakes. We do. He doesn't. So, let's think about a story in the Bible where someone made a decision to do something and there were consequences and things don't turn out the way that they want them to. This was probably the funnest and hardest confirmation class story I ever did. Outside of, you know, Isaiah running around naked for three years. David and Bathsheba. David. Yeah, he's on, at his palace and he sees Bathsheba and human nature kicks in. What happens? Well, he calls for her. 
They do something they shouldn't, and a baby is created. And then he sets out to have Uriah killed after he won't go and sleep with his wife so that he can cover it all up. Who says the Bible isn't full of interesting stories? It's as good as some of those romance novels that are out there. But he, fast forward, we get to the point where Nathan, he tells him a story and David said, well, he should die. And then Nathan <laughs> reveals to him, hey, that's you. So now David knows the consequences for his actions. He's not going to die, but the child will. And yet what does David do? He prostrates himself. He's dressed in sackcloth, probably had ash on his head. He's prostrated, and for seven days he waits, he prays, and he fasts. Asking God to save his child instead of taking him away. Praying in hopes that God would change his mind. So let's pick up this story in 2 Samuel, uh, starting at chapter 12, verse 13. It says, Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. After Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent a deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife. David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. The elders of his household pleaded with him to get up and eat with them, but he refused. Then, on the seventh day, the child died. David's advisors were afraid to tell him. Can you imagine? Gotta go tell the king his child has died. They reasoned to themselves. He wouldn't listen to reason while the child was ill. They said, what drastic thing will he do when we tell him the child is dead? When David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, and he went to the tabernacle and worshipped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. His advisors were amazed. We don't understand you, they told him. While the child was still living, you wept and refused to eat, but now that the child is dead, you have stopped your mourning and are eating again. David replied, I fasted, and wept while the child was alive. For I said, perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. Even though David was repentant, God's answer to his question to his prayer was no. David took responsibility for his actions, knowing he had done wrong. But unlike Saul, let's take a few years, step back a few years, unlike Saul, who disobeyed God's command to completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation, men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys, and if you're curious, go to 1 Samuel 15. Saul didn't follow the command completely, and in doing so, he angered God. Because when, what happens when Samuel shows up? He hears the bleeding of the sheep, the mooing of the cows. He says, what have you done? Now, Saul, he was more afraid of the people and what they would say and do than he was of God. How many times does that happen out in the world today? 
People are so afraid of what the others around them will say that they push God to the side. Now, God isn't looking for excuses. David didn't make an excuse. Saul certainly did. He just wants obedience. David and Bathsheba would go on to have another child, Solomon, who the Lord loved. This is just one example of how when we put ourselves into, well, our own circumstances, we make decisions that put ourselves sometimes in jeopardy, sometimes in bad situations, sometimes with an empty pocketbook. But we have a tendency to do our own harm, if you will. Well, in the New Testament, we, we read of someone who had not placed himself into the circumstances that he was in. This is this goes back to this is where from David and Bathsheba to this person in the New Testament where God works in mysterious ways comes out. We don't know sometimes where God is leading us. We could be walking down a clear path. And we take a turn, and what happens? Can't see anything. And we have to rely on God and in faith. Well, join me in chapter, or John chapter 9. This is the story of the man who was born blind. Starting in verses 1 and 2, it says, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Well, let's look at what that looked like in that day. In those days, it was believed that a serious birth defect such as this, well, they were the product of some personal sin, or some even believed it may have been because of the sins of the parents. Hence the disciples' question, was it because of his own or his parents' sins? And it might not necessarily be a birth defect. We could go on a whole tangent on the book of Job here. You know, what did Job lose? He lost family, he lost his wealth, he lost his health. He wasn't born that way and he wasn't because of any sin. God will sometimes allow our circumstances in our lives because he needs to accomplish his work in and through us. Those things are done for our benefit. We may not understand it then or even into the future. It might be way down the road before we get it. It might be when we enter eternity that we understand it. Many of you hear me say it's just a minor inconvenience when I'm dealing with something. It's just a minor inconvenience. And in the grand scheme of things, it really is. I mean, you remember Mark's uh, line that he had up here and the little dot that was just our existence here? in all of eternity. Now when I say it's just a minor inconvenience, it's not to trivialize what I'm going through. It's to emphasize that God is in control. God has it. And in the grand scheme of things, well, yeah, eternity is very minor. It's just a little bitty part of, of life. As I do go through things, I do pray that God would open my eyes to see the lesson. I'm not so sure that I would consider all that Joseph went through with his brothers, like being sold into captivity, thrown in jail for something he didn't do, a minor inconvenience, but it was God's plan. How did that turn out for him? He was able to see through it and in Genesis 50, 19 and 20, it says, but Joseph replied, and this is to his brothers, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? 
You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And he would go on to save the lives of the Egyptians and of his family and the Israelites. It would be fair to say that we would not be going through all the circumstances that we currently do had the original sin not been committed. That's part of why reason life is hard. I mean, he did say that make the ground hard to till and childbirth would be painful. But this is the hope that we have and that when God's work is finally accomplished, there will be no more pain, no more death. It'll be over because we will be sitting in his presence. For those of you that, that have seen the second episode, at the very beginning, we saw Jesus and he was in, it was in a dream and he sees John out in the field and it's just dead quiet. And as John gets closer, we see that he is in shackles, metal, heavy metal shackles and he's smiling and then all of a sudden he breaks free that is what we have to look forward to because we'll be in the presence of God John did not see it as a problem he saw it as the end goal now back to our passage from John, different John. It was not the sin of the man or his parents, but because of a third option that Jesus would give us. So let's look at verses 3 and 5, where Jesus says, It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That suffering that we endure, some of it's to just simply bring glory to God. Think about all the things that you've gone through. Now God has then used you to help someone else. The hard part is getting through it. Because we can't always see what it is God has in store. It's like walking off into the fog. It is in those times that we need to remember Paul's words to the Romans. And Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them is in everything that God is working for our good. We're not left to our own devices as the world wants us to think. They want you to think, you just believe in this imaginary thing in the sky that has no bearing on your life, yet we know better. The key here is working for our good as there are so many things in our lives that are not good because we do live in a fallen world. Living in a fallen world means that there is evil all around us. But I would also say that that is both seen and unseen. There is a spiritual battle that we can't see that is happening all around us right now. Just another reason why we need to well, not need to. We must. We absolutely have to. We have to start and pray about everything. Those who don't believe in God, those who do not have Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those who are not being transformed by the Holy Spirit, those people are not going to see all the things working together for their good. Jesus goes on to heal the blind man. But listen how. Then he spit on the ground 
made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam meaning scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. So he used dirt at his feet and the saliva in his mouth to make the mud. So let's think about that a minute. How were we created? Genesis 2 Evans tells us that man was made from the dust of the ground. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never read anywhere that saliva is this magical healing ingredient or component, heat some kind of far out healing agent, if you will. Yet it was what Jesus used to make the mud as the ground would not have stayed on the mat. you imagine if he just picked up some dirt and yeah, it's just going to fall right off his face? So there needed to be a, something to hold it together. And just as in, it, in, just as in any relationship, I make myself a tongue twister, it took faith for the man to go and do what Jesus said. Now you remember the story of the eunuch he went, well, let's go get baptized. But how about the one who, when he was told to go dip himself in the Jordan seven times to heal his leprosy, he got all ticked off and had to be reminded that if it was something easy, he would have done it. The blind man, he just, he heard, he listened, and he went. We have to have the same faith that God is doing things for our good as this blind man did. He didn't complain. He was right there, in fact, when Jesus was telling the disciples that it wasn't for his or his parents' sin. But so the power of God could be seen. He also didn't complain about having mud put on his face, let alone that it was made with spit, now, spit does clean things, because I remember, you know, when the kids were there, you know, clean it up. But he, I mean, he didn't complain about it. He just went and did what he was told to do. He was simply grateful for what Jesus did for him. Now, what the story doesn't tell us is whether this blind man or even his parents had been praying for this healing. But they could have been praying his entire life because he was born blind. And once they heard about Jesus, they may even have started praying for Jesus to come to their town and to heal their son. Now I would think that because the blind man so quickly listened to what Jesus had told him to do, that this was the case. He and his parents had been praying for and I immediately think about all the people that we pray for. You know, the prayer sheets are on the back table. That list grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks. And we have seen miracles happen. We've also heard no. We've also heard not yet. Prayer is powerful. And that's why here at Grace Street, we make it such a priority. Things get problematic when we don't pray. Diane and I pray about and before everything. And when we don't, we recognize it. And I know Mark and Lori do the same. And from my own personal experience, I have witnessed the difference between when you do and when you don't. Just in my more... Yes, I get up and I get my coffee and I do my devotionals. I've told you guys this over and over again, but sometimes I forget to pray for my, the people I'm going to be talking to throughout the course of the day. And then like 20 minutes into my shift, it's like, oh, sorry, Lord. And I say a quick prayer. Now, this is a constant learning thing. 
We're constantly learning. We're not perfect. And the disciples, they are following Jesus and they're constantly learning as well. But they also like us slip and fall back on their old ways. They forget to pray about everything or for that matter, to think about what it is that they're saying or doing. And this is evident in Mark chapter 10. And it starts off at verse 35. It says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to, the, to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. And I'm going to stop right there and make you wait. This is to give you a foretaste of the next episode. But what are the things that led up to this point? Now, in our episode that we're going to watch on Wednesday, James and John, the sons of thunder, well, something rubbed them the wrong way. When Jesus declared Peter was the rock on which he would build his church. Now, I'm sure there were a few other things, but it, it's interesting to me that Jesus says that to Peter. They get a little bent out of shape, but don't say anything. And then what happens next? Jesus grabs Peter, James, and John, just the three of them, goes up to a mountain and has a little meeting with Moses and Elijah. <coughs> These three witness Christ's transfiguration. And James and John still have a burr, if you will. They wanted more. Human side kicks in. They wanted much, much more. I mean, I'm not going to lie. When I, was a, when I was younger, it was all about the money. How much money can I earn? How much, what do I need to earn, do to earn more money so that I can have more things? And, and I found out that having more things isn't necessarily a good thing. But they wanted more. Why is it so hard for us to be happy with what we've been given? when we pray for things, when we ask God for things, do we really think about what it is that God wants for us? Now, I can't remember if I've told you this, this story. If I did, it was once, it was a long time ago. I have a little, this little metal John Deere track. It's got the metal wheels and everything, and I, I love playing with that thing. And we went to Christmas at my aunt and uncle's, and a old present rip over the box. And what is it? Another tractor of the same kind. I threw a hissy fit. I was like six or seven at the time. I didn't know any better. I learned a valuable lesson that day. God teaches us valuable lessons through the things that we go through. When he does answer our prayers, he's not just Going, okay, yes, that one, no, that one, wait. No, yes. He has a plan. The question is, how do we respond? Think back to David. How did he respond? He waited, he prayed, he fasted, even though he knew from Nathan what the outcome would be, that the child would die. And when it was all said and done, he accepted God's answer for what it was. He cleaned himself up, and he went to the temple, and he worshipped God. No, play, no blame game was played. He didn't get mad at God. Why, God, did you do this? You all know somebody like that who has blamed God for something going wrong, for a death in the family, taken too soon, why, God, why, I don't love you anymore. And as a parent, if you've ever had a child say, I don't love you, it tears at your very soul. But God is faithful and he continues to love on us and continues to try to work the plan through us. David, 
He knew there was nothing that could bring that be back. He knew, though, that he would see the child again someday. So how would you respond? How would it affect your relationship with God? How does it affect your relationship with God when you go through something devastating? For so many in this world, it just tears it up. We need to have the heart of David. We cannot be so presumptuous as to think that we know God's purposes for the things that he does. Doing so puts God in a box. We try to limit him because we can't fathom what it means to exist in all time, past, present, future, and know all things. But we can't let it frustrate us. Instead, as in our call to worship, we need to rejoice. First Peter 1, 6 and 7, and this time from the New International Version, it says, in all of this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. And these are not temptations sent by God because he would never tempt us to sin. James writes in James 1.13, no one undergoing a trial should say I'm being tempted by God for God is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. We know that Job was allowed to go through trials and God deemed that trial necessary. Not maybe so much for Job's sake, but for Satan's. And to prove to us, see how we can go through these kind of trials. Is in doing so in just the right amount to strengthen our faith. James tells us this several verses earlier when he says, starting at verse 2, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. James and Peter, they're talking the same thing. Life is a marathon. It requires endurance. When Peter says it was for a little while, he is speaking about our earthly existence. There is something beyond. That's our eternity. Those trials Peter was talking about, well, they do three things. Number one, they prove our faith. Specifically, who or what we have faith in. Because it's how you respond. If we respond as David did, we have faith in God. If we respond as the world does, we're relying on ourselves. Second one is they develop that faith. As we go through trials, we are developed. We talked, Mark was talking about the refining of gold. The goldsmith is, I mean, he puts a little fire under us, yeah. But it, what does it do when you put fire into gold and you melt it? The garbage floats to the top and it can be skimmed off and you're left with pure gold. That's what God is doing with us. He's helping to develop that faith. And when we do so in the same way as David, well, these things, they glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will never know what we believe until we face the test. I saw something online this week. It was, the specificness of it isn't relevant. But the person said, would you help in this instance? Do, should we be doing this to take care of others? And they, oh, these two were like, yes, absolutely, let's do it. We got to get it done. And what happens? Man on the street, if you will, brings up someone in that very circumstance and then asks them point blank, can you help this person? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't have any money on me. An excuse. 
the test became real when they put her face to face with this person rather than just a hypothetical type situation. Just as we use fire to refine those precious metal, God is using trials to refine us. And it's in these trials that he will see our genuine faith. We may try to fool others. Others try to fool people into thinking that they believe when they don't. And it, when that happens, when he sees that genuine faith, he is able to separate those who have the superficial faith from those who have it a true and genuine faith. Separating the wheat from the chaff, if you will. For those who truly believe, their faith will be strengthened. It is our prayer that you would let the whole heavenly goldsmith refine you into the person that he has created you to be. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. You have given us as a ministry and as a church so many tools to help us to grow, to learn lessons so that when we do come across those trials, whether they are of our own making or trials that you're putting us through, that we would respond like David that we would have a heart like David. We will make mistakes. We know that, Lord. But if we are following you, if we have a pure and genuine faith, you will continue to use those to refine us and prepare us for our eternity. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for all that you do. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. You know, it's amazing. To, I, I've let you know many times that, that uh, when we're doing the messages and Terry sends me an email that says, here's our call to worship for the week. And I get the verse, and that's it. But what's really amazing is that I pray about it, and God says, oh, I want you to say this. And so if you notice the call to worship this day, how much it matched with what his message was. God is good. And we do that with prayers and everything all the time. It, it's amazing to see how well God works within our lives each and every day. And that's why I always open up with worship by saying, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to accept what God is preparing for us in these messages. So I, I was sitting back there just kind of smiling the whole time. Terry's probably going, what is What's with him today? But it was because when I wrote all of this, I had no idea what he was writing whatsoever for a message. And I'm going, contra me. I love it. God's here. He's working. So I want you to think about that because as, as we go through our communion, it's a time for us to gather together um, to commune with one another, to commune with Jesus in the sacrifice that he made. It's a time for us to remember all of the great things that he did for us in providing that path to salvation, the refinement process to refine and define who we are and who we need to be so that we can be in the presence of God. Because when that time comes, we're being prepared this way so that we can stand in the presence of God. And so we need to be refined. We need to define ourselves as Christians to prepare us to be in the presence of God. And so as Jesus was preparing his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. If we think about that in the breaking process of his body, he was being tortured for our sins. And so as we partake of his body, we are partaking in 
that refinement process that he went through, not for his sins, but for ours. Likewise, when he took the cup and he filled it and he blessed it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And it says to go on and do so in the scriptures. Each time that we gather together, we are to do so in remembrance of him, in the remembrance of the sacrifice. But furthermore, in the text of our message today, we are to do so because it's to remind us that we're being refined and defined into a glorious figure that can stand in the presence of God. That's what we need to remember. God has a purpose for us. He is defining us for a reason. He is refining us for a reason so that we might join him in his presence, in his glory, and then in doing so we can bring glory and honor to God. The body of Christ broken for you. Take it. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see everybody again today. So today it's again time for prayers for the people. And if there's anybody that would like me to pray, let me know. Need prayers for the family of David Thomas. Okay. Um, his mother has had a stroke and uh, she was trying to recover from the stroke and um, not going well so far. Okay. So I okay. appreciate that. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, as we pray this morning, I invite the Holy Spirit to rest among us that all who are listening online and all who are here will feel the presence of the living God. Help us to know and understand the will you have for each one of us in our lives. As stated in Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Help us to finish the race set before us by being kind to one another and always remembering the greatest commandments, Matthew 22, 37, and 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Please, Father, help us each and every day to do your will and not our own, so that what we do with our lives will be pleasing unto you. And Father God, we lift up these, those families that have lost loved ones due to the Hurricane Helena, those who have lost everything, Lord. Father, you said in this life we will have troubles. No one is exempt from this. That is why your second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself, so that people will help those in need, help the lost, and bring restoration to a torn land, and people who are devastated by loss of loved ones and loss of property. Please place this on their hearts of men to gather together to help those in need to show your love to those who are hurting. And Father God, for those who are suffering loss of a loved one or have someone in their final stages of life, please give them peace in their hearts that passes all understanding that only you can give in these times of great trials. Be near to their hearts and help them know that they are loved. And Lord, we lift up David Thomas's family. Be with them in their trials. Be with them in this time of sadness. Um, lift up their mother and just heal her body, Father God, as only you can. Give them um, compassion and a heart to help her and help the doctors know what they are doing to give her hope for this future that she has. Um, give them guidance in all that they do. Thank you, Jesus. Father, for those that are suffering great trials of all kinds of illnesses, COVID, cancer, and mental illness, 
Hold on to their hearts, Father God. Help them to trust in you for their redemption and restoration. Help them not to fear a doctor's report, but to believe the report of the Lord and not to give up because you are a prayer way, Father God. Help them to trust and honor you and give you glory for their healing. And I ask that for Dave Thomas's family as well. And Father God, please hear our children and grandchildren when they pray. Guide them in the ways of everlasting. Help them to show kindness, love, and mercy to others. For this is how you love them. And Father God, watch over our homeless population. Please give them hope for a brighter future. Help them not to be complacent in their trials, but to always look to better themselves and to find a job that will lift them up and out of their current situations. In Hebrews 13, 15, 16, through, though Jesus, or through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that comes, that confesses his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. For those of you that are joining us online, thank you so much for being with us today. The uh, music has been posted again, and it takes you to our website. Just click the playlist at the top, and you can uh, then listen to that music that we will be singing today. You can also, from that same page, go back, and if you haven't seen the previous messages in this series, you can get caught up on that same page. Let's close this time out in the word of prayer. Father God, you have put together our church, our church family, giving us people with different talents and different ideas and put us together. Just as Mark had mentioned earlier during the announcements, there's a whole discussion going on about what the menu will look like on Saturday for men's breakfast. You've given us ways to reach out to folks, whether that's through the men's breakfast, through horse track racing, through our movie ministry. Father, we need to continue to pray, to pray for your will, to pray for your guidance, both in this ministry and in our personal lives before our feet even hit the floor in the morning. Father, we need to be praying for the full armor to help us to get through the day. And that whatever challenges, or shall I call them opportunities, come our way, that we rely on you, as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us, we should not rely on our own understanding, but on you. Help us to remember that lesson, Father. Help us to have that heart of David. Thank you, Father, in all that you do. In Jesus' name.